everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein. As we all know, 1999 is a very popular year to discuss on Attendance Bias. However, the overwhelming majority of shows or jams from that year on this podcast are from the summer. It's a little more rare that a guest picks something from the fall or December tours to break down. That is the case today, as our guest, Andrew Matrenga, chose the two-night run that closed the fall tour, Albany 99, from October 9th and 10th of that year. It would take a total of a probably four-hour podcast episode to cover both nights, as well as an overall look at the tour. But this two-night tour-closing run deserves discussion, so Andrew and I agreed to talk about set one from October 9th and set two from October 10th. When Andrew and I first began speaking, before I began to record the conversation, I knew this episode would be a good one. Not only were we digging into an underappreciated tour, but the energy that he brought when talking about the New York State Capitol, the two shows, and the fall tour overall is infectious and undeniable. So let's join Andrew Matranga to talk about Strange Folk, the original Tab Trio, and October 9th and 10th, 1999, from the Knickerbocker Arena or at that time the Pepsi Center, in Albany, New York. Andrew, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm amazing. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm glad you're amazing. You picked an amazing run to talk about today, and we'll just, for brevity, we'll call it Albany 99. Does that yeah. fit? That is it. Yeah, and for those of you listening who are a little bit more stat-focused, it would be October 9th and 10th, 1999, the tour closing run of the Fall 99 tour. And we'll get a little bit more into those statistics in a bit. Uh, Before we get there, though, Andrew, thanks for being here. Thanks for choosing this run. Fall 99 is not the most popular choice of guests of attendance bias, although 1999 is as a year. But fall seems to be its own little microcosm of fish in that year, and we'll dig into it. But before we get to the show, before we get to the music, let's talk about you. As a fan, Andrew, let's get into the Attendance Bias Lightning Round. Attendance Bias Lightning Round. So, Andrew, when was your when was your first fish show, and what do you remember of it? It was my first fish show was 8, 10, 96 at Alpine Valley. I, you know, grew up in Chicagoland in the, you know, in that era. What do I remember? I remember getting a ride in the back of like a box truck from Chicago with my <laughs> friends from high school. Um, there was a lot going on. Uh, no, our friends were in a box truck and then we were in someone else's car trailing them. There was a lot going on to get up to Alpine Valley from Chicago back then. I remember uh, the Son of a Mule Jam was really wild. I remember the, the Reba. I, you know, I was going into my uh, sophomore year of high school. So some, some bad decisions were made my junior year of high school, excuse me. So some bad decisions maybe were made that don't, I don't um, remember as much as I should, but I also do recall really though, specifically being up on top of the lawn and looking from that big tree down onto the stage and that huge shed in the ski area. And they were playing whipping post, which was Fishman. And like, I, I didn't realize that that was such a bust out or such a gag. And I also was an Almond Brothers fan because of just classic rock background. So I was kind of like, it was one of those moments where Fish challenged me in a way that I wasn't really ready for. But I, I just remember loving, you know, the whole show because it was my first show. I mean, Bathtub Gin, Reba, um, you know, Donald Disease. Those are Harry Hood. I mean, those are all a day in the life. Those like then Fire Encore, that click checked every classic rock bucket Beatles, almond brothers you know what i mean jimmy hendrix those are the things that i grew up on so if fish were ever to win me over i mean those, of course you get the tapes and you instantly recognize them but i specifically remember of course the ride up there and you know a lot of it was lost in, in history in a way and you said this was the summer before your junior year so does that mean you yeah. were 16 years old I was 17 at the time yeah i just turned 17 so i was a pretty young person that you know also and what did you know of fish going in? So obviously when I, I we were in high school, so all my friends went to that um, Halloween show and I just was just getting on the bus at that time. So I was listening to fish and I, I, I wouldn't consider myself a full blown fan until after that. Cause everyone came back so excited and they just, I was like, I guess I got to give more, more time to this collecting and all this stuff. And, and that was when I started just trading tapes like crazy, you know? Um, oh yeah, there was a sunshine of your love tease during the mule mule duel, which normally I'd never be like, oh, I love sunshine of the mule. But like, then they were doing interesting things, right? So 
yeah, we I was early in my fandom, but you know, all me and all my friends, especially that that uh, Halloween show at Rosemont Horizon, really like changed the landscape for us as fans and and, and just my tight knit group of friends. The tape trading went wild into '96. I was I over here in my office. I still have four racks of fish tapes from that time. You know, I have. It's funny that yeah. you you put so much onus on that Halloween '95 show. I do too. When I was first getting into fish, I grew up in New York. And when I was first getting into them, I would go around Greenwich Village to look for CDs and tapes and bootlegs, of course. And when I saw that, it was fairly well-packaged bootleg of fish at Rosemont Horizon. And it was the cover of Quadrophenia, you know, that black and white cover with the the mod, Jimmy. But instead of the Who, as it is on the real album cover, it said Fish fish on the back. And it had all four members in the his the um in his scooter mirrors. And when yeah. I found out that Fish had covered Quadrophenia, because my big classic rock favorite band was The Who. Me and too. So well, one saw, of those, all the ones I named. Yeah. But same. But you got to pick one, right? At least one. And for me, yeah. The Who, Uber Allahs, like The Who yeah, yeah. above all. And so when I saw that, I could remember, I could picture it right now being in that like underground CD store in the village, just be, Oh my God, my new favorite band and my other favorite band yeah. are now one. And it yeah. just blew my mind that that could happen. Yeah. So I understand I can relate to what you're saying about all those classic rock check boxes. What was your most recent it. show? And what did you think? I was it? able, I was able to hit um, this last Dick's run here. I live in Colorado. And so I actually had taken a pretty long hiatus uh, I did the 2015 run at Dick's. I did all three nights, which was amazing. Uh, very special. They did the thank you encore. And me and my friends, we uh, we used to carry around the I am happy sign that said thank <laughs> you on the on the back. And that's part of the story for tonight's uh, run. Actually, we'll get into that and, and, you know, how so much of its community. But I didn't see a show from 15 until 21 after the pandemic at Dick's. I saw the last night. I was always good, by and large, for the Sunday night at Dick's. Is from when they started playing there pretty much. But then um, I did get to see uh, two of the shows, the first and the last night of this Dick's run. I went to just the seconds. I've never done this. I got a ticket. Like I was with my family at Red Rocks for a kitty show. On my way home, my friends are like, we got an extra ticket. I got home to North, you know, North of Denver, got back in the car and I drove, was listening on Mixler <laughs> to the first set. And I showed up at the end of uh, Fluffhead, you know, on the floor. I was like, I went from Red Rocks to my house, to the front row at Dick's basically for the the set closer and then i ran up to my friends and i saw him in the for the second set so sunday night at dicks is always really special it's it's quite a party so jesus man you are a road warrior in the truest sense of the word on that day i was but yeah, yeah. so i saw the first the, i saw the first night of the run they you know they did the four nights and they had that one long ass rain delay set and Dix is always kind of an interesting, you know, there's a gag there and stuff. So like, it's always so hype, but mostly I just love the venue. Aside from Fish, which band or artist do you think you've seen the most live and in person? After Fish, it's either going to be, it was strange folk because of my timing back in the, in the, uh, you know, I went to Syracuse University. That was when they were the height of their powers, the late nineties, 98, 99, and then Reed left. And I still would see them and poster for them. I'd like it to hang out with them. I went to the Garden of Eden fests, you know, so it's probably strange folk back in the days where I saw a ton of shows. MMW would probably be like a distant third though, just because of the, 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 you know, the amount of, uh, you know, shows I could have seen of theirs. They don't tour as much. I went to college in Buffalo just a couple years after you, not many, just a few, but to be in central New York or upstate or as upstaters would call it, Western New York, where I was. That's Western New York. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm very well aware. I've been reminded a billion times (laughs) by locals, Uh, but to be there in that general region, central to Western New York in the late nineties, if you're a jam band. Well, you could go from bus you go from Buffalo to Albany and just run, you know, run the highway. Like, yeah, all 90. You know, yeah. You, yeah. You, yeah. Just don't, like you're hitting Rochester, you're in Syracuse, Binghamton, you know, you can do go to Cornell if, anyway, like if it's a lot of time. Yeah. If the, I mean, New York state's a long state, but I mean that I 90 corridor has, has music galore. Right. So. Yep. Uh, what is your most controversial fish opinion? I don't know about that. At the time, it's all in context, right? Um, but I remember just loving that Fluffhead from Alpine 99, speaking of the year 99. And I loved it then. And I listened the shit out of that jam. And I loved it so much. And I always thought I got a bad rap. And 94, 99 in general, summer was, you know, druggy and 
stewy and gloppy from the you know the sick at disc but like i think though that that time frame you know 99 just in general gets a bad rap uh, the second one would be like just my nostalgia for like february of 2003 you know like even though it seems ridiculous like i was fortunate to see those hampton shows at, in 2003 and then all state arena classic tweezer i was in cincinnati you know they're with the people i'll mention tonight like February 2003 has some pretty outstanding playing that had the band not gone so south, um, you know, that that would have been looked back on as a really classic era, I think, of Fish. But we all know what happened a year later. It's hard to, like, build on that. You know, they yeah. kind of just fell off the table, right? Agreed. Agreed. I've talked a lot on this podcast about 2.0 as a whole and how February 2003, you could look back and see as almost a perfect tour. And then once right. you hit that after the summer, once you hit that late November, the turkey run, the Thanksgiving yeah. run, um, that's where things it's almost like the gas was just out of the tank. Yeah, There's no gas in the tank. This it's all, and that's when the empty light went on. Yeah. <laughs> like that run. Well, and there were the, the drugs in the scene were so different than too. There's so many pills, and like I just remember Oxycontin and, and and Molly being so prevalent that like you ride those highs and lows, and it's not for me personally, I just I remember you were around like yeah, it was in the scene. It was almost in the air. Yeah, it was just like it just so you can't, there's no through line for your emotions when you're constantly, you know, consuming like that. I think that was, you know, we all can agree on that being a problem. Yeah. Well said. If you could choose a venue for fish to play, regardless of its size or location, just for you, where would you have them play? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, because, it, you know, it, if it's just for me, there's no crowd. And I'll mention just the recordings of, of this run that we're talking about and how great, you know, audience recordings are. Well, put it this way. There could be. A no, crowd. no, I, I have the answer. Okay. No, I'd ha- I have the answer. I'd have them set back up in fucking Seminole, Florida. And and we do the midnight to sunrise set again and we just do it again. And I still have vivid exact memories of that night. But like, just play the same damn, not, not that you'd ever want to fish. <laughs> but let's just do that same thing for seven hours and let's go, you know, and, and, but that's not fair. Cause that's like one of those epic shows, but I, I, I less care about the venue and more about how I wish it were just like two sets of like mostly improvisation. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'd rather not. The setting could be just like anything like fish can turn a shitty venue on the banks of the Delaware river and came to New Jersey into the best <laughs> night of your life. So like other than your own living room, which I don't think fish would do a good job at that because of they need sound and lights and scale. Uh, I would rather hear two improvisational sets that are almost like the it sound check and tower jams, like back to back. The final question of the lightning round for everybody. What is the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? I kind of will never forget you know the the way coming out of big cypress and just like the mass of bodies that were just asleep and in various states of consciousness and just like we always nostalgize this stuff and we like to like fish tour and being on the road trip is like a battle obviously it's nothing like being at war but like it reminded me of those like derogate type you know or uh, those images of like the civil war where there's just bodies like on a battlefield you know and a lone tree or something you know like <laughs> in the distance just surveying that mass of humanity after what we sort of all went through you know like I, I just yeah i don't know i think that was like something that really sticks with me just like people in that moment you know on the first of the year in 2000 was, was pretty special When was this show played? You brought up 1999 earlier and you used a couple words, maybe gloppy. And there's a lot of talk on this podcast about 1999 and the different parts of it. So let's go over just kind of an overview. Let's periscope out about 1999 and then zoom in for the fall 1999. So Fish played a lot of shows in 1999. Interestingly, Two distinct tours in the fall and winter, which very rarely happens before in the early or mid 90s, they would just kind of wrap it together. Right. It would be kind of you go like the fall, November, December is all the same or whatever, whatever, October, November. Yeah. Yeah. But this year there were two distinct tours in 99. The fall tour. This one was made up of 24 shows. They started on September 9th in Vancouver and they ended on these two nights in Albany, October 9th and 10th in what was at then called the Pepsi Center. But having grown up in New York, my life, the it's the, yeah, it's we, the we were there for the Nick. We yeah, it was the Nick. Knickerbocker Arena. Uh, the tour focused mainly in the Midwest and the Southeast before 
four shows, a quatrain in the Northeast, two shows at the Nassau Coliseum. And then these yeah. two at Albany. I saw those two shows at Nassau. Nice. And I wasn't as up as you were at the time in trading tapes, so I didn't know what to expect. Uh -huh. But this fall tour featured tons of highlights. Uh, there were set lists yeah. surprises and an evolving sound, which I'm very interested to get your perspective on. Uh, I yeah. thought that this sound would fully blossom and develop through the December 99 tour. It was like they didn't miss anything from no, one yeah. to the other. Like, for example, on uh, Chicago, you mentioned uh, living in Chicago at a point, uh, Sugar Blue joined yeah. Fish on October 3rd at Rosemont Horizon yeah. for the Encore. Uh, for the encore. Tom Marshall, one of my favorite personal Fish moments, because I was such a big fan of The Who, played, we're, sang, we're not going to take it at the Nassau Coliseum. Yeah. So that tour is interesting. Like the fall, you've got that, like those, the Boise bag and you've got like that crazy show at the pyramid venue and whatever. But 99 is, is in a way like as a whole year, interesting. Cause that's when Trey really starts touring with his, the trio or whatever. Right. And we get like that manifestation of the post story of the ghost era, like the, like all the loops. Right. And then he introduces the keys. They do the first like they do the summer tour, which is like good, but yeah, controversial at the time. Some great stuff, of course, happens, but not forgettable. But like, I, I don't know. It's it's tough for me to go back to like summer 99 or other than I, attendance bias. I was at Alpine Valley. And my friends all went to Deer Creek. You know, Polaris is always big for my friends in the Midwest. Those Oswego shows are really good. There's like a lot to like about summer 99, but it all sort of starts early in that year with like Trey and his solo tour. And then they start doing like they do just a little bit in Japan. They set that seed. And so that's a very unique uh, moment. And I think to end that summer. And then we get, we, like you said, we have the fall tour and then, and then we have this sort of, uh, well, where the fall tour is where we are, right? Like they go from West to East and that's always fun to end up at the, uh, you know, um, especially in a classic set of venues like Nassau and the Nick. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yep. um, and then I saw a few shows in the fall or in that, that's what we'll call winter tour. I was fortunate to be in Cincinnati and then Rochester for those shows. I, I think of those five shows as this narrative for me personally, like we all like to tell our own story. Right. And then we're all just leading up to, to big Cypress anyway. Right. It was always building everything about 99 was always building up to, to, to big Cypress in, in my mind. I've had, I think, and I, I'll double check these numbers. I think this is the ninth guest out of maybe a hundred or so who has picked 1999 and maybe seven of them have been summer 99. So it's a very common choice in terms of which year. And everyone mentions what you just said, that starting when they introduced or when they announced at Polaris, I think it was the New Year's festival at, uh, at Big Cypress, that from that moment on, Everything felt like it was just building toward there while still establishing its own identity. You know, there are highlights oh, yeah. that you could mention, but everything in the back of everyone's mind. And as you got closer to the winter, what, moving what's going to happen? What are we right, doing? <laughs> right. And the sound overall during the time, I think I do have to start in the summer without getting too detailed. It'll take us forever. But yeah, yeah, we'll over, over the of course it. of yeah. summer 99, they, I think that fish jams would kind of vacillate between supersonic, like speed frenzy jams, and then yeah. chaotic dissonance, like just walls and layers of noise, usually within the same jam. And then once fall yeah. came around, they didn't quite give up on the supersonic speed frenzy, but they spent a lot more time with the dissonant, spacey ambience, like the disconnected. And that's not true of every jam, but I think that's a fair description for the most part. And in addition to Farmhouse, or like you mentioned, Tab songs, like yeah. Heavy Things and Back on the Train, the release of the Sicket disc in June of 99 yeah. kind of pointed the way in this direction, that it's going right. to get spacey out there. You mentioned the drugs, and the music kind of reflected the type of drugs that the people were on, you know, yeah. especially if you're in the back of the lawn during those summer shows or upstairs yeah. in the arena shows. It's kind of like you could just zone out and get glassy eyed for maybe 25 minutes right and have a great time yes you could i i, I would not have but like <laughs> yeah like and i would say that like it's just interesting because of you know and i, I remember like just really felt like it of course everything trey especially at that time was doing i mean he was everything to all of us right like i mean say what we will about the state of fish like he was doing different things, doing acoustic stuff, you know, he's writing new songs, 
wind or a bug, like all these random mm-hmm. sort of like just soundscape things that what's the use. Were, yeah, what's the use? But he wasn't playing those with those bands on his two set shows. But I just remember like his May tour, like closely following it. I didn't get to see any of those shows, but like there was just a lot of scrutiny, especially there was a vacuum naturally in the first part of the year. So whatever Trey was doing and how those songs built into the fish sound, like you said, the farmhouse songs that they hadn't been recorded yet. I don't know. Like it's weird because it's so not connected to the way fish sounded, right? Other than like Trey sitting back and being able to do the loops and just sort of jam more. Um, I still think that when you go back and you want to like look at moments of 99, Phil and friends, huge, right? Huge, just like for the scene, but not for 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 Trey or for Paige who played with them. Those are just signal moments for us as a culture to like go back. Like remember when like that was a big deal. Look at everything happened with like you know the Goose guys. Like I'm a huge fans of them and I love their music and love their trajectory. But like that was a bigger deal back then, right? But we didn't need Fish to get any torch to play with the Phil and friends. That was just like a one off thing, right? That was yep. just musicians doing their thing. But it just it's to me it helped like establish and further entrench fish like within the popular culture the masters of the jam band scene name it what you will right that still adds to the sound though of like the playing and everything that between trey doing like his own thing these film and friend shows and then the sick at desk on top of it those are like three different venn diagrams all combining into one right well put, so yeah. Anyway, that brings me and us to this moment where we should talk about, you know, whatever, 8, 9, and 8, 10, because I just, that's where we end up by the end of the fall tour. Forget December, forget Big Cypress, right? Well, that's a perfect segue because I wanted to ask you, who were you and where were you yeah. in this part of October of 1999? What led you to these shows? Yeah, this is one of my favorite actual stories because it actually is the last 25 years of my life. I um, was a sophomore at Syracuse University. I was just coming off like a really awesome summer as a summer camp counselor. It's a pretty classic story. Me and my buddies, you know, we we all, you know, pile into the car and go to Alpine. We went in 97, 98, 99. This, these would have been my seventh and eighth fish shows. I saw one, uh, two in 96, three in 97, very fortunate to be at Deer Creek in 97. Uh, that city is, of course, amazing. I saw the Alpine show in 98. And then I saw Alpine 99. So I was deep. I was the one getting everyone their fish tapes. Like I said, I got this rack (laughs) of fish tapes here. I had like six of those cassette carrier things. Like I was building other people's tapes collections at that time. Um, But I was also a sophomore in college. So I was seeing Strange Folk. I was seeing a lot of MMW, all the bands that would tour through Syracuse, Ominous Sea Pods, you name it. I was a jam band geek, all of it. Sign me up for all of it, right? But I'd been seeing like widespread and and mo and stuff in high school in Chicago in the in the mid nineties there. But but I was at peak jam band fandom in a way, right? I was like postering for String Cheese Incident when they toured in Syracuse, so I was primed as a fan. But I didn't have tickets to these shows. But I show up at Ultimate Frisbee practice, of course. I'm checking. Of course. All the, like, I'm checking all the white boy like boxes here, but I'm at the ultimate Frisbee turn or practice and I'm wearing my Gaiuti lot shirt that I bought at Alpine 99. And did you have right? a hemp necklace with some sort of stone? None of that. No, but I did have like the Boston Birkenstock clogs. And okay. I wore Fair enough. So I was, I didn't, I didn't wear that shit, but like I had long hair still. <laughs> I still had long hair down on my shoulders. Actually, I ended up chopping it for, for big Cypress. I went like basically full buzz cut to go to Florida, but um, I had long hair and I'm wearing a Gaiuti shirt in the sky uh, and I'm going to shout him out Tim O'Shea one of my dearest friends now to this day he's like oh cool guy you shirt i actually have some extra tickets to albany if you want to go i'm like okay but, like yeah 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 whatever turns out the guy's name is andy who he's selling the tickets he looks like me <laughs> like everyone's like you're my name's andrew like they're like you're like his doppelganger he can't go to the shows he's living in the city whatever i get these tickets i go with my friend tim it's our first like time ever and like we're in the car together, road tripping from Syracuse to, to Albany, where we're going to meet these people that he met in Columbus at the shows and at Deer Creek that he camped with. It's this beautiful like fish, you know, tapestry a classic story. story where, yeah. 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 We're like weaving every, all these people together. I am like a total noob in a way to like just and away from home and all this stuff. And we're just going east on 90 to get to 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 get to the Nick in time. And then we meet these people and outside of the, you know outside albany at their hotel we do our thing we go to the show we meet more people in line blah 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 like so it's it's one of those beautiful stories of of like serendipity where i meet this guy tim he's an old school fish that he'd been seeing and taping fish since like the early 90s 92 it was his first fish show in syracuse he like we were in the area where he like 
we were the benefits were like Mimi Fishman and Dr. Fishman were like throwing shows in Syracuse, right? Like it was still a small enough community where like people knew people. I didn't know these people. But I'm like, I stood next to John Fishman's dad at a show at Stalin's Rhythm Palace. You know what right, I mean? From like, Henrietta, right. Right. From like, so it's like all these things are coming together in this beautiful world. I meet these awesome people from Ohio. They become tour friends. We are still hanging out 25 years later, you know, all because I wore my Gaiuti shirt. They play a Gaiuti in the first set. Right. So like we have these narrative moments where like, I, I meet another guy, his name's Mark. My dad's name's Mark. We're hanging out the show. Like there's just all these awesome things that lead us to like set one at, at, at the Nick of this two night run. I think the second set is, is pretty legendary. Um, but there's these narrative moments for me where I'm on my first real like fish road trip by myself, just kind of throwing caution in the wind with a guy I barely know who meeting up with people he barely knows. And we're literally still the happy family, you know, pH, like we made the sign, we carried the sign for 25 <laughs> odd years. Like I'm in the farmer's almanac in the, you know, whatever on the back cover holding this sign. Like I was this person who I still am today, but it also led me to write my master's thesis in grad school about like fish tapers and how the tape trading and the community nature of the internet back then, before file sharing and Live Fish Plus and all this crap that we have today, it required people and that one-to-one -one connection that, again, like I have a lifelong friend, this guy, Tim, but then also like he's the one who gave me the CDs right away after the show. He found a source, ripped them down, burned them out, and I had, you know the CDRs of this show within a few days because of that community. So there's a reason that this show is one of my favorites specifically than first night, but it's also one of my most listened to things is I was able to access that music right away. Whereas very few people in any other fandom before what we have now with nugs.net and all that stuff, being able to get the music and that relationship with that person who got you the music, whether you go into those bootlegging places where you dub your max LXL twos or someone, you know, of course by 99, it's a lot more CDRs, but yeah. It, that who was I then? I was a sophomore in college who was playing frisbee, and you know we're all getting really psyched for fish at Cyprus. Actually, right? Like, like that was a singular focus for the whole fandom at that time. Set one. Well, let's break down the show. So, for those yeah. of you at home, Fish closed the fall tour of 1999 with two shows. We've mentioned at Albany, October 9th and October 10th. Andrew and I discussed both of them. We figured that it would be a little much for one podcast episode to go over both shows to break them down. So Andy had a really good idea to do set one from 10-9 and then set two from 10-10. So it's basically one show's worth of breakdown, but really we're getting the full Albany 99 experience. So set one of October 9th begins with Punch You in the Eye, the best show opener pound for pound, if you ask me, and I have the microphone. Uh, everyone must have been so hyped. I mean, Albany is a fish town, right? Yeah, it is. And when I, I listen back to both of these, uh, I listen best both of these sets to just because it's one of my favorite, most listened to things. What I love about audience tapes and this room too, just because of the way this room sounds, Mike especially was so boomy and bassy and sometimes that's a problem in the mix but because of the way trey was playing then this is okay and the recording i listened to anyway but like you can hear a roar in the crowd at this moment and there's a couple other roars in the crowd especially in the first set like the segue into free is really big and and it it's it's the way this people are hyped you can just hear it yeah. in the tapes and like in the 2001 in the second set, there's like multiple times where the crowd is engaged, they're clapping, they're cheering, they're just like randomly like exclaiming things. It's like you it peaks, you can see the EQ like peak, you know, <laughs> yeah. and so like, so punch is a big opener wilson of course gets him fired up guy I, you know the shirt like the guy was there with mark like hated guy like he was chasing him around by that time <laughs> in his career but i still was like i i'd heard it too i think in 99 uh at, at uh uh whatever at, at alpine perhaps um so and it's a composition but it's it's these cool counterpoints like punch is like kind of funky and energetic milson wilson is short but really like you know aggro and then we get the super tight composition so like early in the set where we get three songs of course that tell a story right and like build us to this moment where ghosts you know whoo, we get all the loops and like there's just everything is of course going on with ghosts that you expect in 1999.
right. So, and you mentioned you mentioned the Nick, like what type of room it is. If for anyone listening who hasn't been there, I would put it up there with in terms of construction and what you can expect if you were going there for the first time. Hampton, the Nassau Coliseum. Hampton. Yeah. You know, all these kinds of old hockey arenas. Yeah, they're even, like, like, sure. super concrete, like Rochester's yes. like it too, but way smaller. Like it's just that concrete, the steps are every I mean, everything is concrete. The whole thing's poured concrete. So it's just like I don't know. Like the sound is just constantly bouncing everywhere. It feels yep. like when you and I I can't sit still. So I'll like. <laughs> well, I did this, I did this show for a variety of reasons. New people, new place. But like I'm especially now. If I go to an official, I I will just walk around. I want to get sound from every area. Yeah. And the sound there is you're like you can feel when it's like bouncing off the back walls in that room. Which I and it's was right weird. across the street from I think a huge parking garage. Mm-hmm. So it it has that vibe for and and they always play it obviously during the fall or winter. They don't play right. it as often these days as they used to. But there's it's for me and I'm gonna swim in nostalgia a little bit. That's what this podcast is for. You know, I I could feel the Sam Smith. Not brown ale. In oh yeah, and then right the parking now. lot, and like, and you're like, <laughs> and then there's like, there's that whole plaza out to like the yes. state capital, and the egg, and it like, there's that building, the egg. You know, it's like super trip. I think I saw like MMW played the egg once. Like, there's just like Albany's a weird kind of modernistic, brutalistic architecture too. So like, there's that contrapuntal nature of like, I don't know, like you're going into this of course, really synthetic environment of a fish show in a concrete box, but like the music is so natural in its yeah. own way. So, like, but then of course you dump out and you're like in this weird future scape of, I don't know, like Blade Runner, you know, I don't know. It's, <laughs> yeah. all very, it's all very weird. Like I just, it just always feels like an adventure, but the, the setup there with the street and like the, the, the concourses my, in my recollection, this is almost 25 years ago now, but like, yeah. And then you dump into a parking lot with all these levels. Like it's just, yep. I don't know. And so yeah, you brought up the Wilson after punch you in the eye. There was a, I wrote sick darkness drone yeah. before the, you got me back thinking, you know, that, uh, yeah. you know, that you're the worst one. There's that part where they have extended it before, but on this one, yeah. it just sounds, you used the word aggro before. That's yeah. what I thought of uh, yeah. this version of Wilson. absolutely and like it's that angst and like i don't know you get all those willie well willie wilson you get all those willies out because because <laughs> i don't know if they wrote the set list that you never know but like going into gaiuti too like you got to like get some stuff out before you like get into this super composed intricate thing with with not a lot of words i mean we're about to enter they do 15 some odd minutes of like punch and wilson and then gaiuti through the into the free almost is like we're looking at roughly, you know, like 40 minutes of some lyrics. Gaiuti has some lyrics. Of course, Ghost has lyrics. Free has lyrics too. But like, if you can get past the Gaiuti lyrics, they, that's when the spaceship is out, you know, out in orbit at that point. You know, you yeah, know what I mean? 100%. Because after Gaiuti, after that really composed section, is Ghost into my left toe. It's, I think, 20. Or is it though? On Fishnet, it's there's no my left toe. On Fish in the Oh, is that right? Yeah, I went, and this is one of those, this is why I kind of wanted to pick this, because this is one of those classic, like, fandom moments of, like, did they play My Left Toe or not? I would I would challenge the listener, and I did this myself. I queued up, like, My Left Toe from Sick of Disc. I queued up the last five or so minutes of The Ghost, because that's where it gets really ambient. Trey's doing, like, at about 15, 60 minutes, it's like a, like a, 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 a thing, you know, and then it, like, mm-hmm. kind of spaces out a little bit. And I was really trying to train my ear to listen to that last five or so minutes of The Ghost, against the my left toe and it's it's tough because the bass and the drums are sort of doing it the piano's kind of doing it but trey's not really doing the my left toe thing i don't know like this is one of those debates in the fandom where you know different set list people 
people they say it's a contested sort of jam yeah well it's funny that's one of those geeky things for me that i'm like oh me too it's a, it's a great jam i think it's just a great jam at that it is, i really like it and it's and funny my, because- i couldn't Go ahead. Sorry. I know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've had um Scott Marks on this podcast. Oh, nice. Is, that guy is awesome. Right? Yeah, he is one thousand percent, and he's one of the guys. They have a setless team there, yeah. and I didn't want to ask him too much because I know things can get contentious within the world in which it exists. And now more, especially on Twitter, because people. Yeah. But back then, I remember, and I couldn't find my setless book because. I, I'm a, a fast studio setless taker. I'd have to look. I, I don't remember my notes. There's no way. Definitely considering my mental state at the time. There's no <laughs> way I would have wrote my left toe. I just would have been like ghost exclamation point jam or something. It was just a jam. Like yeah. it, it wasn't and it's good. And it's great. And but it's very there's like there's the page thing, and then there's like a little like ding ding ding. I don't know it's hard to explain like on a podcast but like trey's doing a line and mike is his bass is coming of course from every corner of the square in a way <laughs> you know being being it's like pink it's almost like a pong right like i don't know i i listened to him side by side album sick it and this i was like listening to him like on two different devices just to hear it and like so if you were in charge of, of fish.net on the set list section, what I would, would say you put no there. I would okay. say no, just because of the guitar line and the, I, it might, it just feels like it's in a different key maybe too. Like I, I play music and I, I can understand those things, but not 23 minutes into a fish jam. Like, I don't know where they landed at that <laughs> point and how it compares to the album version of the sick of this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I would say, I would say no, I would just say no, because it's more fun to be, to, to agree with fishnet in this case, because I'd rather just have it be a massive ghost in, in, in a way. Yeah. And it, it is either way. There's a part right. about 13 minutes, I think, or maybe 14 minutes where Mike is really the leading boom. the way. <laughs> yeah. He does the same thing in the, in the 2001.
it's that's why I think that this first set is so nice the way it, it foreshadows the second. The the role of Mike, especially through the rest of the show, from goes through the rest of the show, Mike is like the actual MVP of the whole show for sure. Yeah, it's I very think. repetitive. It's yeah, I wrote it's a proto, I always wanted it this way. It's mm. very, very repetitive, it's very beat centered. Mike is there, and unless you're really listening for Trey, it he's not I'm sure he's playing but he's not the center of attention like he usually is. This is what was hot at the turn of the century. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not that far off from EDM or techno in a club. Yeah. I mean, then they ride yeah. it for a while. The only note that I wrote down after that is the farmies are kicking in, which I'm sure yeah, a lot yeah. of people said around That's that just time. Yeah, I, and I don't, and I was not on the farmies. This was actually, you know, back to that story is the first night I, I, I did mushrooms. So like, it, this is actually when things go here just for me too and it's and it's one of those times where the music is writing the story of my own experience right and 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 it from ghost all the way through the slave right like i was not i was already a fish fan there's no question about that but the the sparkle you know free is good there's some nice moments um i really like well anyway listen back to the last five minutes of the ghost it's really great it up uh, if you're a fish geek next to the my left toe disagree with me all you want i'm fine with that um <laughs> free though there's a couple moments i really like too the way uh when they're doing the the floating the word floating and the word free and when trey drops out of the vocals and is just playing his guitar yep. and they hold the word flow like really long and then free too to close the song the last like couple minutes of free are are really again kind of bring that whole point of the set to like a close like it's only four songs but it's whatever you know it's it's a, a fair amount of music we're looking at at this point like 40 odd minutes of music no 50 minutes of music we get the sparkle blow off some steam and then possum which doesn't really de deviate much from its structure you know, you know what i mean like yeah i do sends I everybody like off I like that free is still psychedelic it it extends the psychedelia yeah. from ghost and well, we'll leave off my left toe for now, but extends the psychedelia yeah. of Ghost, but it's still a more grounded song because Ghost is a yeah. springboard just a jam. You know, it's not yeah. a complicated song. Free is. Uh, it's. I wrote it. It gets exploratory at about six minutes, but it's still in the free box. Type one. Like it's still All day. free. Yeah. All day.
Yeah. And then Sparkle is a nice treat. It's a very straightforward way yeah. to kind of get us out of that jammy headspace we've been in, like you said, for about 50 minutes. It, it grounds yeah. us, which is important. Yeah, no, and and like for, for the haters, like it's like, oh, Sparkle. I'm like, I may or may not be a Sparkle hater. This might be the first, maybe second time I've ever heard this song. So like, hate all you want. It's just a, a fish song. You know what I mean? But yeah. like, you also need to like, clear the palette and then and then head in and and i again i the second set of this night we should go to the next set the next show but like the second set is all really one great story throughout i i i was you know died and was reborn <laughs> you know what i mean oh, like really? like yeah well and like mentally intellectually like, i know it what was you really mean. special <laughs> but like the limb by limb is really special especially like the last few minutes and then the way it leads into the 2001 um 2001 has like four or five different movements it's it's really special. I, I, it's probably one of the most listened to versions of any fish song I've ever had. And even the waiting and the velvet sea is really amazing. Of course, the fact that they end up doing it at Cyprus, like it, it just, that song, I re-listened to it and it, it sounds better now than maybe it didn't even in the room, but it was a big version of like a song. And I don't know that whole, the whole second set is really just special. And I, I'm very thankful to have been there. I, yeah. Well, before we move on to the next night, it should be noted. I don't want to leave it off. It didn't, blow my mind but they did close the first set with possum it's just i want to put it out there i don't want no, anyone, it's great i don't want anyone tweeting at me saying you didn't mention the possum but no no i mentioned it. it it's nice it's okay. it's relatively straightforward i i mean i just and it's also one of those set closers it i um i like pot i think for me possum is the best like first set closer or not best yep. it's a great first set closer nothing beats an antelope really in a way but i like, agree with you there yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it's it's a more straightforward version, but like, you know, nine some odd minutes of a of a possum is is a, a jam in E that very few people are gonna be unhappy about, you know. Hi everybody, Brian here to welcome you to the set break of today's episode of Attendance Bias. First, thank you for listening. And second, just a quick reminder to tell you that even though Attendance Bias comes to you for free, it does take a lot of work and it does take quite a bit of money to keep the lights on here at production. So I just wanted to ask a small favor if you could support the podcast in any number of the following ways. If you could leave a review or a rating of it on whichever podcast app you use. If you could spread the word telling a friend or someone you think may be interested in it about it. Or probably the most concrete way is to go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash attendance bias and donate however much you can financially to help with the continuing costs of attendance bias. So thank you again so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the second half of today's episode. Set two. And so now we're on to day two, set two. Yeah. So this is October 10th. The first that's really forgettable and even in my own mind. So the stash is pretty hot, if I recall correctly, but I don't want to like I never hate to hate on anything, but like the stash is probably the only thing to go back to. Right. This you don't want to hate is, on anything, but it's okay to well, have an opinion. Well, and I will say, so the first night I remember we were on the page side up like midway in the concourse or whatever. And I just remember the lights and all the things of the first night. So that was my position the first night. So I was kind of looking out at the crowd and that's when you can see the lights play across the whole floor mm -hmm. and stuff. So again, being under the influence of, of, of a psychedelic, like there's a lot to remember for me about the light show and just the humanity on the floor. The second night I was on the floor and I was like midway just in that sweet spot right by the soundboard. So I remember, of course, you're a little burnt out after a night, like the first night, it was really epic. Like it was a really epic night. And of course, on a two night run, you're always going to throw down after that first show. You got to mm -hmm. save some matches for the second night. Maybe that's why the first set for me, only, you know, six songs or seven songs. But I just remember it's the last, this is it is the last set, right? It's that that anticipation, you know that something's got to go down because it's we we got to wait a whole nother two months before fish comes back, right? Like it's rare to not have the 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 Thanksgiving tradition or whatever, but like this means this is it. So then they come out and they do nothing. Like when I say nothing, they just jam. Like yeah, and like it's listed this, that way on fish.in. Right. It's listed as a standalone track as jam. Right. And so it's like it's like okay wow <laughs> you know like wow and like it's like cool like i said i told i told i said at the top i was like i want improvisational fish so like this is like 
boom, right in the sweet spot and it's ambient and it's sick at disc, but it's, you know, and like when you're on the floor and you see everyone around you, you know, and I was relatively sober because I knew we had a long drive that night. We're going right back to, I, well, maybe we went to the hotel, but like, it's just a different vibe, you know, especially like there's just, again, we only, we know we got about an hour, hour and a half left. Like it's, you know, so, but then it goes into the yam and, and, and again, the, the jam is beautiful, but like this, and like it says on fish.in, like, there's two jam segments. There's no bass and drums. There's no vocal jam. So that right there just puts it back into improv fish in a way, right? Like you're going to get 26 minutes of boy, man, got shit, whatever. Cool. Right. <laughs> like yeah. you get that whole thing. I, I had a website for a while of boy, man, got shit dot com or whatever the only thing if you typed in boymanshit.com was the albany m of this year because i was there attendance bias of course but because it was 33 odd 34 minutes of of this what is the quintessential fish song and like a jam and no vocal and then the lack of structure at the end and it covers a lot of ground and and i don't have I, i'd like to hear your notes on what you saw here for this this section because i Again, I'm so biased to that first night, especially the second set. It's funny because as you're talking, I'm thinking back to what you said at the very beginning of our conversation about where would you have fish play? And you place them back at Big Cypress at the Seminole Reservation. But instead of a seven hour set, you would have them just play improvisation. My first note for the jam that's listed to start set two of October 10th is uh, it's developing something of a melody at about four minutes and 14 seconds, but it's more like a secret set of a festival. That's where it plays. Or like me. sound checky, you know, like yeah. sound checky. Like for me, in a way, it's not very good, but like sound check fish is like so awesome. Like it's, and I'm very fortunate not only to have like kind of went to the rail at the big Cypress sound check, like in the field, like we all like flocked like night walkers to the, to the, <laughs> to the lights. I just finished Game of Thrones actually for the first time. So anyway, but like I remember like walking in the middle of the night to go listen to sound check fish at, at Big Cypress. I also remember sneaking in in 1998, one of my favorite fish stories, sneaking into the sound check at Alpine Valley in 98 and seeing and experiencing like sound check fish where this is them as just people and musicians. And that's what this felt like too, where like it's rehearsal recording room fish right and so that's just very intimate so i think that sets the stage for the rest of the set like caspian you know say what you will about fucker pants but like coming out of this yam like again you got to reset a little bit like and on fishnet it, it has like an, a jam into you know we love the nautical analogies with fish so we're on yeah. this boat we've been out at sea and now we're back in port uh with 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 prince caspian which I it's think is notable nice though i want to talk a little bit more about that jam at the end of you enjoy myself yes, where you please. said that where it's uh prince caspian kind of grounds us a little bit after you enjoy myself like you said the song portion there's a lot of guitar theatrics like there always is you know trey yeah. uh just ripping through it which is fun i'm sure it's great no to the last like four minutes is just like yeah trey, just like it doesn't <clears> do much <throat> for me i don't I don't go crazy over guitar theatrics. For me, it's yeah. time to get a drink or to go to the bathroom. But it does get experimental at around yeah. 20 minutes. And that's my type. I have a feeling you and I have a lot of the same tastes when it comes to jamming. And then about, uh, you know, it, it's like bliss no, jamming. A... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's like 20 it's, minutes. Like, yeah. 
I'm listening it, to it as you're talking. It's Bliss Jamming it's about 15 years before it was called Bliss Jamming. Oh, for sure. It's there. You know, there's, there's a little funk. There's no bass and drums jam. There's no vocal jam. It should be. No, noted. it's actually a bass and drum with Paige and Trey doing like not allowed, like playing their vocal parts, but with their instruments. Yeah. Yeah. It's and it's very refreshing. It's a lot of fun. You mentioned the recording that it's a little boomy. There's no yeah. boom in this section because Mike is not really playing that much. Uh, there's a shrieking jam. And that's the word yeah. I used, shrieking and a guitar solo. Yeah, this last end. five minutes goes bonkers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I love it. And it does slide into Prince Caspian. It's not a straight segue, but there's no break in the playing just the same. Yeah, no, they they take that like, and then it kind of like just dribbles into it. And and then we get a train song, you know, Caspian's good. Like it, it does its job. Yep. Brings us home. It's clean up. It's clean up after that crazy, up. you enjoy myself. And then train song is to bring us I've back always, down. Well, and so, you know, and I just started playing Ultimate and one of my, you know, it's not a hard nickname, but they called me Man Train because Matranga. So Train Song became one of my anthems. So like my buddies who I'm with, they're like, you're a train, train song. You know, it's always <laughs> like this internal narrative, like with you and your friends, always, right? Yep. Um, bathtub ends up being a nice, I mean, I I have a friend who he's like, I, I, I can't, I, I don't ever want to hear Bathtub Gin again. I'm like, well, it's still like another thing. They, my email was Trangy Joker at the time. So the Joker and takes a bath, like right, these right. songs were all like speaking to me, like in a way over these two nights, Gaiuti shirt, train song. And 2001 is just one of my favorite tunes. Like this Bathtub Gin, I like it. Character Zero, we get Jedi Trey and it's just, you know. But, like, and there's, but there's a jam. I don't want to run over it in Bathtub Gin. It's like right after the song part ends and it's about four minutes and 45 seconds. It seems out of nowhere. They truly do have ESP. Yeah. They all know what they're doing right away. No, yeah, and, the boop, pop, boop. And then it just goes into a new segment entirely. Yeah.
and there's like this calypso ish inspired like yeah. they they focus on the upbeat uh, and i wrote I, I guess i gotta uh get in touch with my uh friend of the pod i wrote i want to know how is this not on the jam charts <laughs> because this is a good it just, you unfortunately it falls so? in at that 10 minute mark right so yeah, it's like true. doesn't like people it's gotta be 15 minutes to be a jam or whatever like i mean uh, yeah Fair like enough. the bias is the bias is always to length. I think yeah. you can do a lot, especially modern fish, does a lot between the 12 and 13 minute mark. Like you could have three minutes of amazing playing from 10 minutes to 13 minutes. And like this is why you travel around the country for these three minutes. Truthfully. Yeah. In in 2019, that was kind of their trademark. Right. And then you like you mentioned, they closed the set with character zero. We're already there. Uh and Trey takes an extended break to thank the crew and talks about. Uh, the, love that. their love of the scene. Yeah. That he says that at set break, I thought this was interesting because they, they never talk about this stuff, what goes on backstage. He says during the set break, they had some champagne. They opened a bottle of champagne. I remember that. Yeah. And so he tells about, about they talked about how lucky they are to have the fan base. Before we before we say goodnight, uh, first of all, I want to give a very special thanks. I'm not going to list them all by name, but uh, to our crew, we we genuinely, from the bottom of our hearts, are the greatest crew in the business. Thank you for giving that name. Uh, these are people who, with much love, every single night come in here and set all this stuff up. Every light that you see and every piece of sand here and cook for us and take care of us and there would be no show without them uh, so thank you all so much and thank you for giving me a hand and uh, to all our family and friends thank you so much for being here tonight we're very close to home we have a lot of family and friends with us tonight and most importantly of course um, in between sets we uh, the four of us cracked a little bottle of champagne and had a toast and uh, one of the things that we talked about when we were back there before we came out was was we never lose sight of how lucky we are to have you as our audience and our friends and it's i always find it i understand where he's coming from but i always find it so curious that trey is in continuous wonder of the scene and he he's so humble in this way where he time. says yes. yeah at that time yeah he's a little yeah, more yeah. self aware now that where he says you know this thing that we're just a little part of and i'm like dude come on man like you not you personally but you the guys plan the clifford ball like yeah. you know how to like you know what you're doing yes right? but it is still nice to hear no it is and i, I you're right cuz like it's actually not it's like seven minutes of the song and then the last two minutes is just straight talking and actually especially for me like those are the things that we like rewind and we listen and we're like on pins and needles at the show, just like, like Trey's talking, like shh, <laughs> everyone, you know, shh. like, like shh. and and when you're sitting by the tapers too, which I kind of was, I was right behind their pod and just watching like Corota work. And, you know, again, I, I like to see all the different angles of the venue. Like I remember that. And then it, it just, I remember his, it just, again, you could feel that vibe though. Like we, we only have however many odd shows, to, to close out the year before this big thing that we're all going to yep. do, you know, and that's where we all really truly back to bath of gin. Like we were all in it together. Like it, it felt like that you knew at that point, like with how that year had unfolded, that a lot of work had been put in for those first 10 months of the year, right. Between the planning they were doing as a band, what Trey was doing him and Paige do the Phil and friends thing. They go to Japan, like, I wish we go to two festivals. Yeah, yeah, the five, yeah, as we go, right? So like a lot of planning and a lot of like just being all over the map like that too. Um I you know, we're in retrospect now almost a quarter century later, but I his little little spiel there was very nice, you know, like it's cool. We all want to be inside the the band room, but yep. we never will. Leave. <laughs> and then the encore, they come back on for contact, which is kind of a standard version. It's always fun to wave your hands back and forth. I'll take and, it. I'll take it every I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. And the Nick is like a venue that's just big enough that you can really see everyone's hands. 
moving back and forth. It's not as enormous as Madison Square Garden, where it's fun, but you can't really see everyone at once. These kinds of venues are small enough that it feels like you could really, if you knew someone at the show, but they're all the way over in that section. If you look just hard enough, you might be able to see them. You can see your friends. My friends were up on on that night. They were up over there. So like, and you know, like we were on this side. Anyway, like, you know, there's a lot of... um, that goes on in that room and contact is nice, especially when it just drops out to just page, you know, like, yep. you know, we're, you're with 15,000 people and there's a guy playing grand piano for me, like contact and all those songs from, from Junta are really special. And I was fortunate enough to like interview Jim Pollock on my podcast oh, nice. and like, cause he was a customer of the company, you know, at sticker giant where I work. And like, I'm like, dude, like your noses and like the <laughs> noses with feet and like noses and lips. And these, yeah. No, yeah, like like your visual style, like who is ever gonna like hear contact and not think of that black and white album artwork and and just how old school early fish was. Like, I mean, again, like there's a lot of ground that's covered over these two nights, but then we really like bring it home back to classic rock. We go from yeah. contact to to a Led Zeppelin tune, and it's like cool. And for those of you listening, it was not good times, bad times. No, played Misty Mountain Hop of all Misty, tunes, like yep, Led Zeppelin Four, it, right? That's played Led it Zeppelin four, four times total. Uh, yes, it is on Led Zeppelin Four. It was a fun. I wrote it was like a rash. They played it oh, yeah. just enough to remember, but it didn't stick around. It was played in Toronto all in 1999. Toronto that summer. Yeah, uh, very 99 cover tune. Yes, uh, September 16th at Shoreline, and then September 24th in Austin and here. It wasn't very tight, but it sounds well played and fun as hell, man. Oh no, I mean the vocals for Fish will never be that great, but like <laughs> so that that's especially this song. There's there's a lot happening, and the drums are very front and center, so it's tough to like keep up, maybe. But I it set us off on a. We went out into that night very happy. I I will always prefer the first night but that jam to the um you know that that 30 some odd minutes of music is when you talk about attendance bias like pound for pound the best half hour of music you can have you know just because it happens to be you enjoy myself right but like yeah you know you go to the first night and you look at the best half hour you could have like give me that limb by limb in 2001 like i i have worn through my cds listening to those two so yeah, like I mean, there's between about a half hour of Ghost and Free, a half hour of um, Live by Limb 2001, and then a half hour of Yam. There's an hour and a half of just just jams, like you could package up. Where like it's no more indicative of Fish in 1999. That's kind of again why I picked this. Like you got your Ghost Free, you got your Limb 2001, and then you just have your let's just call it Yam. Yeah, you know, like those are all eras in a way. Uh, new and old and i don't know there's a lot to 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 like about it andrew matranga thank you so much for joining attendance bias for really bringing us back to a time and that's kind of the purpose of this show of this podcast to wallow in nostalgia a little bit to hear everyone's story it's a hell of a drug <laughs> yeah it is a nostalgia. hell of a drug i keep coming back you know it's it's i'll always keep coming back so but thank you for telling your story for help breaking down at least one set of each show and reminding us why october 99 is more than worth our time to listen to oh absolutely like yeah no those four shows like you said nasa and then and then uh the these shows here like uh this the way they kind of wrap up and push us into uh, that, you know, end of the year vibe of December in Cyprus, like it all builds on itself. And I, I was actively listening to those four shows because they, um, they meant a lot to me at the time as a fan too. Like I was, I was heavy duty in, in, in my fandom then. So I spun the hell out of those four shows cause they meant a lot to me. And that's it for my conversation with Andrew Matrenga. We were going pretty fast and loose and fast with the facts, so it was definitely required today to have an attendance bias fact check. Attendance bias fact check. Andrew brings up a lot of shows from Deer Creek and Alpine Valley since he grew up in the Chicago area. His first show was on August 10th, 1996 at Alpine Valley. 
Luckily enough, we had a guest, Josh Millman of Passion House Coffee, review the show a few days later on August 13th at Deer Creek. That episode is available if you scroll down on the podcast app. The Halloween show that Andrew mentions that his friends all went to but he didn't was October 31st, 1995 at the Rosemont Horizon in Illinois. Fish covered The Who's double album Quadrophenia, plus played legendary versions of their own songs, including Iculus, Susie Greenberg, and my personal favorite version of You Enjoy Myself. Andrew also brought up the jammed-out version of Fluffhead from Alpine Valley 1999, that was played on July 24th, 99, and there was a full episode of Attendance Bias where guest Mike Lowe tells what it was like to be there in person. The Boise bag that Andrew mentions for the Fall 99 tour is a legendary version of ACDC bag that was played on September 14th, 1999 at Boise State University. Furthermore, the gig at the Pyramid that Andrew mentioned was played two weeks later, on September 29th, 99, at the Pyramid Arena in Memphis, and features one of the best versions of 2001 ever played. When talking about 1999, Andrew brings up a few Phil and Friends shows, quickly comparing it to the recent Trey and Goose tour. For anyone who doesn't know, Trey and Paige played as part of Phil and Friends for his comeback shows after his liver surgery in the spring of 1999. Those shows were played on April 15th, 16th, and 17th of that year at the Warfield in San Francisco. If you've never heard any of those recordings, shut off this podcast right now, look them up, and enjoy about 10 hours of some of the best music you may ever hear in your life. And that's it for the fact check, and that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Andrew Matrenga for joining me today, Fish.net for its help with the fact check, and Fish.in for the recording used in today's episode. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review of it of your podcast app or by visiting www.buymeacoffee.com slash attendance bias and donating anything you can. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time on Attendance Bias. Attendance Bias.